can be found on Campus Ministries YouTube page. I'm going to pass things over to Chelsea, who will be introducing our panels for the day. Hello, everyone. My name is Chelsea Tennis. I use they, them, their pronouns. Um, I'm the graduate assistant for the LGBTQ Resource Center. Um, and we might have a third panelist joining us. She has, you know, it's a enrollment and class registration season, so she's trying to meet with her advisors. But um, Aditi, if you want to introduce yourself, then we'll hop into the PowerPoint. Hi everyone, I'm Aditi. I'm an international student from India and I will be talking about the Hydra community today and I'm excited. <laughs> awesome. Let me just share my screen. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Awesome. Okie dokie. So the whole point of doing this panel was um, just to kind of dispel the misconception that transness or um, like third gender identities are something that's new and only seen in the Western um, kind of gender theory. Um, so the learning objectives are to increase the awareness of global and historical presence of gender diversity. Um, for people to have a more complex understanding of um, gender diversity in terms of experiences, identities, and expressions, and to have a more of a compassion for gender uh, inequality for trans and third gender individuals, but also just to kind of start questioning, um, you know, as we kind of go through some of this, uh, there might be some points that kind of hit home where, um, you know, like um, just your own identity and I think it's important that we continue to um, engage in some self um, introspection, especially as um, Jesuit base. The whole thing about truth finding and faith, I think kind of plays an interesting role here as we uh, kind of move through um, just learning more about ourselves and about the world and kind of how those two things interject. So um, we'll do like a general overview of both of some of the identities that we um, uh, are going to introduce and then we'll kind of dive deep into some more questions and then we'll open it up for um, panelists to have some uh, additional questions that you may have. Um, in my undergraduate uh, degree, I was an anthropology major and I did some research on the Lakota Wink Day. Um, it's a third gender um, that's found in the great, um, well, specifically the Lakota, also known as the Dakota, um, which were part of the Great Plains um, indigenous populations. And the gender system for the Great Plains um, populations were pretty similar, um, kind of almost comparable to our modern uh, gender system, even though they had a trinomial instead of a binary. Um, and then Winkti uh, means would be a woman. It's a third gender Lakota uh, identity for boys who later take on women's dress or occupation and enter their third gender identity. And this is usually through um, the um, uh, Lakota boys having a prophetic dream in which they choose the symbol of traditional femininity, a quill, because um, the quill and quilting of the Lakota is very um, uh, central to the feminine identity. Um, they're choosing that over the symbol of traditional masculinity. Um, and I will kind of just explain this little uh, grid up in the corner. So on the left square is like how Western society ranks what's most important to understanding someone's uh, gender, but also sexuality. Um, so, um, you know, you can dress however you want, you know, TikTok and modern uh, gender is kind of a, uh, embracing uh, boys who wear skirts. And then the next you can kind of have whatever job that you would like um, and still be affirmed in your gender. But it's start, we start to question someone's gender identity once they start behaving differently from what we expect. So a tomboy or um, a really effeminate guy, we kind of start questioning their gender or their sexuality. And then the way that Western society really determines what 
someone's um, gender or sexuality is, is based on their sexual object choice. So since we have heteronormative society, if you like girls, you're probably a boy and you're probably straight. Um, it's kind of how we determine how we make sense of other people's gender and sexuality without getting to know them. But Native American society, especially the Lakota, um, they kind of have a different ranking system. So um, in that society, the sexual relations that you had were pretty much uh, had nothing to do with your sexuality or your um, gender identity. Same thing with demeanor. Um, there were some gender roles that kind of like embraced um, like aggressive females, but that didn't change um, the fact that they were women in their society. Um, the things that really hit home about what your gender is in the Lakota uh, culture is how you dress and what occupation and role you fulfill in your society. So the fact that um, the way that the like prophetic dreams kind of people choosing the symbol of your occupation one over the other was really um, important, especially with gender identity um, reasons. But I think it's just really interesting to point out because we have a very, you know, our culture has a certain kind of ranking system, but that doesn't mean that every culture always forever has the same ranking system to determine someone's gender and how we kind of understand what that means. Um, lastly, the Winkte, they acted as um, physical and spiritual he healers. They were people who would foresee victories in wars. They have one of the roles is to give lucky names to babies um, and they had special roles in ceremonial dances. So I'll trade it over. Hi everyone. So I do want to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. I have lived 18 years of my life in India, but I do not identify as trans or hijra. So please take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt in the sense that if you meet someone who's trans from India or someone who identifies as hijra and they say something that's contradictory to what I've said today, listen to them, please. Um, but so hijra is a term that's hard to translate in English just because it's such a distinct culturally rooted identity. But if you really had to put a name to it, then it's a community that largely consists of transgender women, but there's also some intersex people and it's an identity that is specific to Southeast Asia. So it's not just India, it's also Pakistan, it's Bangladesh and Nepal, but I can only speak for India. Um, so that's what I'll be focusing on today. So I don't know about Nepal and Bangladesh, but in India and Pakistan, hijras are legally recognized as the third gender. There is some conflict from within the community about whether they like that term or not. There's a small number of people who don't like it and prefer the term transgender, but majority of hijras are perfectly comfortable describing themselves as the third gender. Um, but some prefer calling themselves trans women, some use them interchangeably. And that also depends on whether they're fluent in English or not. But sometimes it's helpful for hijra rights activists to use English terms because even in India, our court proceedings at the level of the Supreme Court, they happen in English and all the proceedings and the paperwork is in English. So sometimes it's beneficial to use English vocabulary. So most hijras realize that they don't identify with the gender that's assigned to them at birth during childhood and adolescence. And from then onwards, what decides the course of their lives is whether they get parental acceptance or not. For in majority of the cases, it's pretty bad and they usually get kicked out. Um, and because of that, they join what's called a hijra family system. Now, the dynamics of the hijra family are so complicated, like anthropologists spend years of their lives trying to study it, and I don't think I can do justice to describing it, but I'll try. The basics of it are that there's a guru. If you've heard of the term beauty guru, it means teacher, it comes from Sanskrit, um, and there's multiple disciples. Um, if you guys have seen the TV show Pose, and know about the ballroom scene in New York and how there's like different houses and there's a mother. It's kind of like that, 
but 10 times as intense and there's so many like rules and structures and hierarchies um, within that system. But the basics of it is that there's a guru and there's like multiple disciples and chelas. The role that hijras play in Indian society and the cultural significance of hijras is that they give blessings on auspicious occasions like childbirth and uh, weddings. Um, the There's like a mythological root of this tradition and I actually love this story. So in one of our mythologies, I know we have a lot of gods in Hinduism, but one of the main ones like top five is Lord Ram. And don't ask why, but he was going on this like exile to the forest and everyone was really sad and they were all following him into the forest. And he said, men and women, please don't, I'm translating, but men and women, please don't follow me into the forest and let me do my duty and like fulfill this exile. And um, Hitra, they were like, oh, loophole, we're not men or women, so we can follow you. And he was so like heartwarmed by their devotion that he gave them this power to like give blessings to people. And that's like the mythological significance of it. And I wanted and I wanted to mention that because this text dates back like 3000 years, if not more, which kind of goes to show that the idea that gender nor conforming identities are new and something that's rooted in Western civilization is kind of insane. And um, also, I wanted to talk about how some of the gods in Hinduism themselves are kind of depict depicted as half male or half female, or sometimes um, in our text, they're depicted as changing their genders. Um, and one of the main texts that we have, which are called the Vedas, they themselves talk about there being three genders or three prakritis, and prakritis basically translates into natures, which is kind of like gender. And it says there that it these texts date back to 1500 BC, which is insane to think about. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Serena, are you on the call? Yes, I am. I had huge issues setting up the um, teams on my computer, so I decided to use my phone. <laughs> That's fine. Did yeah, you? I didn't late. Like, I I don't know what's wrong with the computer. It just didn't work this morning. That's fine. Did you want to give like a brief overview of what you'll be talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, I guess slides wouldn't really be um that necessary because we're only touching like on part of the topics that I did research on. So um, anyway, yeah. for my English topic, um, I mean English. What am I saying? Well, for my English project, um. I did research on the gaming industry, and then I did focus a lot on the um, women's role in the um, game industry because um, there are some um, statistics that are that are like really shocking to me. So I did research on that and also um, gender and racial discrimination um, in the field. So a um, couple of quick um, statistics. Currently, um, in 2020, there are 47 percent. Um, female gamers, um, close to 50%. And um, even though women are like, women players, are, female players are very much like half fat half comparing to males. There are only 22% of women working in the field and only 2% of transgender. Um, on top of that, um, women among those 22% who are working in, who are working in the field, 73% um, of them are um, actually have to work a second, if not a third job to sustain themselves because they cannot work as professional game developers. Um, um, another thing that's really, really serious with, that's seriously wrong with the game industry is um, sexual um, harassment and discrimination. Um, so in 2014, there was an event called Gamergate um, it was started by Anita Karkisian, and um, she was a, um, a I believe, um, Canadian um, journalist and writer. So she did write, start write about, um, well, she did start writing about um, 
women's um, unjust treatment working as game developers and then started the whole movement of hashtag Gamergate and Me Too and a lot of women women were like brave enough to um, come forward and then discuss their own sort of um, abuses working as female game developers. Um, some of the um, people that they, um, some of the people that were accused did get punishment, but most of them just like the company just let them slide and nothing really happened to them. Um, in last um, June, it was on June 23rd, 2020, um, 70 more women actually came forward to um, talk about their sort of like experience being um, sexually assaulted. Um, as game developers, um, and again, it's six close to seven years after Gamer Game in 2014, but no one really did anything in long time. And during this time, the total um, game market value, uh, total like revenue, basically annual annual um, global revenue from 2016, it was 101 billion dollars till. 2020, that's estimated, um, um, the number estimated goes up to um, $196 billion. So despite the, basically the industry booming and then like um, thriving from an economic level, economical level, like um, financial, financially, um, people, employees treatment are still very much like, um, like they're still, the employees are still suffering from this kind of um, um, labor exploitation and women are still very much underrepresented um, in game industry and then one little thing to note also is that you might have seen like a lot of um, settings like a male character um, leading or like taking care of um, a small girl or like a little boy but you never really see a lot of rep representation of motherhood which is like a huge misinterpretation because whenever you see women as playing the roles as mothers, they either die at the very beginning or uh, they play this sort of like evil kind of um, character and they call it the dadification, so daddyfication of um, video games. And once again, there are a lot of things that are still wrong with the video game industry and then women and then minorities particularly are still the group that's um, that's being like in a way looked down to. So um, because I myself want to become a um, game developer myself after graduation, so I really hope that I could do something to improve the um, current situation. Awesome, thank you, Serena. So let me move to the next slide. We're going to move into our structured questions for us. And these will kind of give us more of a deep dive into understanding how these different genders and um, situations um, live today versus and how like the globalization and uh, things like that have affected um, how um, like gender identity, gender expression and the experience that these people have. Um, so I guess we'll talk uh, um, each give a little like minute or two to kind of reflect. Um, but how do um, individuals in uh, live in their authentic gender identity today? Um, I'll kind of start us off that way. Um, just a model uh, for the other panelists, but um, today the wink tea and other two spirit um, Native American people um, mostly um, there's like two pretty much divides of two spiritness. Um, if you are someone who goes and lives in a city, um, it's usually the gender expression and gender um, un like identity is much more Western, mostly because on reservations, um, because of like colonialism and um, what is it um, like missionary work? A lot of uh, homophobia was introduced, like um, gender identity and spirituality of um, uh, Native American cultures, but especially in the Great Plains. And um, if 
since that was like um, imbued into the culture, um, especially once people were removed from their native lands and put onto um, reservations, um, a lot of two spirit and um, queer Native American people had to leave the reservation to kind of live their authentic life. But there is a movement starting by the two spirit and uh, Wink Tea people um, to include ceremonies and um, like gatherings that focus on um, like letting people who are Wink Tea or two spirit um, participate in the dances that they were never allowed to in their like authentic gender um, and just like really reclaiming the historical significance of um the culture and like their role in their society versus like um so it's not so much like claiming western queer theory and identity and it's kind of like a revitalization of their own history um while kind of dealing with the ramifications of colonialism did um RIT or serena want to talk about how um, individuals live their authentic gender today, if you haven't already touched on it. I can go first. Um, so, um, it's actually similar in India because we were also colonized by the British. Um, and I think there's another question regarding that. So I'll like save that for later, how it's different now compared to pre-colonial India. But um, because of the transphobia that was introduced into our society because of 200 years of colonization, unfortunately, it's like how I mentioned, it's pretty much dependent on how the parents proceed once the hijras come out. And in the sense, the word hijra actually means someone who leaves his home and goes like it almost means like an outcast so in india almost the difference in between someone identifying as trans and someone identifying as a hijra would be whether their parents accepted them or not so if they did get parental acceptance they could live in their homes and identify as trans whereas if they i'm sorry can you guys hear the vacuum Sorry, someone You're else. <laughs> can you guys still hear me or should I wait? I can hear you. Okay, so, and whereas if their parents don't accept them, then they're gonna have to join that family system. And only when they join that family system are they gonna go through the rituals that initiate them into living as a hijra. Um, the, the sad thing is that because of the transphobia that was imported into India, um, trans like hijras face so much discrimination in terms of employment, in terms of healthcare. So they really have to live in these family systems, and often they have to turn to begging or sex work. Um, and kind of what I was talking about with how culturally it's their role to give blessings. So most hijra people do that in exchange for money. So if there's a wedding or if there's a childbirth and so they're gonna go, they're gonna do their um, like ritual and their ceremony and then they're gonna ask for money back. So that cultural significance, they've almost adopted as a way to survive because society has been so harsh to them. Uh, should I continue then? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I was um, chatting with Chelsea um, yesterday, and this whole idea of like embracing your own sort of an identity isn't really that huge in China just yet. Like, generation I would say after, like, born after the year nineteen ninety five would be a lot more open than born before that. So. My parents um, are very liberal and I was raised very liberal and um, um, even though they're like open people, 
it is still particularly hard for mom, my mom to accept, um, say, like, uh, someone who has a different sexuality. Like, it's, it's still difficult for her to sort of, like, imagine that as something that's, quote unquote, normal. Um, and I th- think the biggest issue with the overall sort of, like, um, trend in China right now is that people are not taking much like initiative or like doing much to really um, sort of like um, reduce the prejudice in the society. Like, you know, in the United States, you do a lot of movements. Um, you could um, make videos. You could um, basically um, make shows and um, do all kinds of things to um, promote yourself and then, again, help people understand um, everyone better. But, like, this is actually a real thing in China that's happened. So um, someone made a video about, like, again, um, teaching people to understand, uh, to understand to uh, understand how to embrace themselves and also others identities basically and then a kid was watching the um, video and then a mother came along and thought it was really bad so she basically reported that to the um, the platform and then they had to basically get rid of everything that's related including that spe- um, besides that specific video so the idea being that parents would try very hard to eliminate at least parents from their 80s i mean parents who were born like from the 80s or 70s um they would try very hard to eliminate the influence of like such media on their kids and that's also part of the phenomenon it's not like every parent is doing that but i would say there's still a long way to go when it comes to like trying to push for this type of like um inequality and on top of that um, protest is really not a thing in China like if you do that you might get arrested and then sent to jail like that also has its political um, aspect to it with um, uh, the government control and everything but overall the government wouldn't really promote um, again this gender diversity either I would say not ever because they really hold on to what's like already formed as this order of the society and they're very afraid of breaking this type of norm and this sort of like system that they developed to control their um, average citizens. So um, I would say that despite the popular culture and despite young people like me and then also um, people as I was saying at, born after ni- 1995, like despite the young generation, we still have a very long way to go to try to, again, push for this gender diversity. Thanks. Um, We'll move on to the next question. Um, Are there any special holidays, gathering, or other celebrations that allow for your group um, uh, to celebrate their gender identity? Um, I kind of touched on it before, but um, Two-Spirit Native American leaders have started um, it started as just like a um, Lakota gathering, but they've actually um, kind of, I guess, um, started inviting any Two-Spirit individuals to join um, just because they've realized that there was a space that um, they need, like people needed to kind of allow um, uh, self-exploration and to live authentically. Um, so there is, um, I think it's in Oklahoma, it's a, uh, two-spirit, like, ceremony, um, um, sorry, a two-spirit, uh, ceremony that happens, and, um, it's pretty much like an annual event where, um, people can come guests uh, dressed in the regalia that matches their gender and their um, Native American um, heritage group. And um, it just allows for um, two-spirit people and um, queer Native American people to um, get together and kind of build community within themselves and to live out their um, spiritual um, role or spiritual um, identity as long uh, in the same way that they can um, 
at the same time also engage with their sexuality or gender identity. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any like special holidays per se. There are a ton of rituals that hijras do. Um, but I think like on a large scale, I would honestly say that um, ever since India started celebrating Pride too, which is not that far back, I think maybe the past like three to four years, like that's a great way for hijras to come and celebrate their gender identity. It's kind of it, it, like Pride in India, like we haven't really become that corporate yet because it's not as big as it is in America. So it kind of just feels like any other like festival that we have, like Holi or Diwali in India. Um, and it's just like a bunch of people on the street and there's like great music playing and everyone's dancing. Um, so I'd probably say like that's the main like big way that Hijras get to celebrate their identity. I don't really think there's anything, not even pride, like um, celebration in China. Um, there might be, there, there should be. Um, I mean, I, I suppose there are <laughs> um, smaller sort of um, um, groups, but that's de definitely not a national thing. And I don't see it becoming one either. Um, um, on top of that, just one thing that I forgot to mention, people still associate um, um, homosexuality with um, AIDS till today in China, and it's still very prevalent. So, I mean, to be honest, I learned a lot more about the LGBTQ plus um, community after coming to States, which I really appreciate, but I don't think I learned anything from back home, from school, parents, whatever. I mean, I do have a couple friends who are in the LGBTQ plus community, like within that range, but um, you, it's, it's like learning about, um, I don't know, like, um, it's like sex education. Like we don't have barely any of that. So you have to like basically dig up all the little sources here and there on your own, which is, you know, highly unreliable, but there, there's this huge lack of like source of um, credi credible um, knowledge and um, information for people to look up to. So that's also really, really sad. So kind of going into that, how has colonialism affected um, the gender identity that you're, you're talking about and the relationship with the larger, within the larger community? Sorry for the typo. Um, I think that uh, I kind of touched on it before, um, but um, especially the um, wink tea identity was something that was revered. Um, historically within the Lakota uh, culture, um, you know, um, there was a, you know, there are things that only third gender um, individuals can do in uh, the Lakota and several other um, Native American cultures. And um, that was like very special and revered on a spiritual and a societal um, level. And for, um, you know, um, missionary work and colonialism that, that kind of swept through um, the indigenous populations, it kind of removed that um, um, like connotation that this is something special to this is something um, perverse and that doesn't fit the like new mode of how people um, were being asked to live and to assimilate to. Um, so it definitely has uh, affected it stripped their like prestige in the society away and also um, like turned their uh, religion upside down and kind of took away that um, spiritual um, importance that they had and um, obviously like as people moved on were moved on to re uh, reservations um, you know as there was a um, um, ethnocide trying to destroy um, Native American spirituality and um, anyone who was caught practicing would be punished or, you know, um, worse killed. So a lot of that um, 
was like suppressed and it was something that even um, gender identity and sexuality were both suppressed and um, it kind of pushed um, queer Native American people to um, leave reservation life and with that um, kind of assimilate even more so into Western um, society. And then, as I said, like now in the last like 10 years, there's been like a revival of um, reclaiming historical context. And even with um, the documentation from the research that I did, it was all through a white anthropologist lens. And, you know, there's obviously, um, there was like barely any um, research on if something uh, third gender from like the like woman's perspective moving into a third gender. Well, there was absolutely no research about probably because of the bias of the researchers. Um, and so, yeah, colonialism kind of affected this um, gender identity both in the moment and as um, the um, like white centric and Western male um, lens that it was trying to look through. Um, while people were trying to understand their culture and even to now when there's Native American anthropologists and people default to the white um, voice in the conversation. So, yeah. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about the position, the cultural significance that Hijra's had in Hinduism, um, but I, I don't know the details about this, but also I know in Islam, they have kind of a similar position where they're considered sacred and just like a little Indian history 101. So we were colonized by the British for 200 years up until 1945 or seven, seven. Um, and before that we had a Mughal, um, like phase Mughal era where we were ruled by a ton of Islamic rulers. Um, and before that, um, there's like a huge chunk of information missing because part of colonization is also that a lot of our texts are destroyed and they're reinterpreted and things are erased. Um, so there's a huge chunk of information missing from that intermediate point. So we know Hijra's had a very important role to play in Hinduism for, from the original text. And then we know that Pre, in pre-colonial India in the Islamic era, they held super important court positions and they taught children and they just had a super important role in the politics. Um, and then we know that once the Britishers came with their like Victorian era mentality, um, they criminalized um, trans people, they criminalized uh, homosexuality, and we have seen and suffered the consequences of that till date. Um, it sucks to admit, but we decriminalized homosexuality two years ago, which is insane to think about because Britain probably did it way back and they probably like legalized same-sex marriage way back and we only got to decriminalize it two years ago. Um, and with that, even it's called the Section 377, which criminalized homosexuality. And even though that wasn't directly related to trans people, but it did mark an, an increase of violence against them, especially by the hands of the police, um, which is also like a product of colonial India, the police brutality that trans people experience. So, yeah. I don't really think there's that much of a colonialism aspect um, historically with uh, the sort of um, changes in China at all, but I, I would say that my openness to um, gender diversity, for instance, and many of other young people, we got a lot of our influence from the, um, well, two things, the, the Western kind of... Um, movies and media and also surprisingly Japanese animes and things like that so a lot of things come from outside influences um not much of original thing um um is basically started in China but there is this okay so um this is definitely 
uh, coming from um, Japan, but, but like, uh, um, quote unquote, young girls now have this obsession of reading like BL kind of a comics and novels and things like that. So, um, you know, people like new things and then in a way, people's ideas about um, homosexuality is also changing um, because say for instance, some, well, some girls in a way, I don't want to represent everyone, but like see the um, like love between the same sex is like the purest in a way. So like that is also heavily influenced by the outside media. Um, one thing to mention also is that back in um, 2020 to 589 AD, which is during uh, Weiji Nanbei Chao, during that time, um, it is actually pretty um, popular for people to date, or well, men specifically, because women didn't really have much rights. Um, but it was popular for men to date um, others of the same um, sex, which is also quite interesting. But apparently that, um, that trend diminished quickly. And... Um, we get to where we are today. Awesome. So this next slide is our last structured question. Um, Serena, feel free to kind of talk about um, either um, things that you want people to understand about your like um, group about the Chinese um, women experience or the um, um, game developer like sphere of um, inequality. Um, but for uh, two spiritness, um, sorry for this slide. I am still like learning how to deal with uh, Microsoft uh, suite items. But um, something that uh, a lot of people, especially myself, when I was before I started to do research, don't understand is that two spiritness. Uh, is not like the same as being gay and Native American. Um, so like it's much more of like embodying two genders, but how we would articulate two genders into one body um, to, you know, certain, uh, especially like the wink tea, um, it's just a third gender, but the way that Western society um, kind of understands it is two genders in one body. Um, it has nothing to do with sexuality, um, especially when you add like Western theory onto two spiritness, um, especially because the origin of people claiming the title um, or label of two spiritness was to delineate it from like um, Western queer theory. Um, so it was like something that. Um, you know, Native American people could kind of latch onto in a way to keep themselves from continuing to be assimilated to um, Western ideologies. Um, but it's still something that um, a lot of people romanticize when they think about um, Native American gender. Uh, and it's really something just like every other uh, trans diverse uh, experience in today's world. It's um, incredibly um, like hard to be, you know, I don't want to say hard to be, it, there's a lot of barriers to living your authentic self um, in the society that we have, especially if you are, um, you know, um, an indigenous person. Um, and so just understanding kind of um, as like white people, understanding what it means, the history of two-spiritness, what it means for people to um, have to leave the reservation and possibly even their spiritual life um, to come live in a th authentic life um, in like urbanized areas and what um, white people can do to support Native American people as they try to revitalize their um, like spirituality and their um, queer identity all at once. So um, definitely do some research into like the land that you uh, currently live on, see what populations used to live there, still live there, should be living there. Um, if, you know, uh, colonization wouldn't have happened and see how you can support them and listen to Native American voices. So that's my call to action for everyone, I guess. Yeah, mine's kind of similar in the sense that I think sometimes when we talk about like cultural identities that are so different and we talk about things like religion and like their basis and mythology, I feel like sometimes in your head you can 
like you can attach like something that's so overly mystical like the sense of mysticism to it and not and like that becomes a barrier in like seeing that group of people as just like people um so yeah i think that's something that i want to emphasize that and that's kind of evident in india too where like on one hand we've kind of deified hijras from our like cultural roots but at the same time we're treating them so poorly and obviously colonization had an effect on that but that's not really an excuse at this point um so just that and also seeing the variety of perspectives in the community itself i think in india there's about two million hijras and just like acknowledging the fact that all of the intersections that apply in real life also apply in that community. So things like class, like whether it's an urban area, whether it's a rural area, um, um, and just like acknowledging the complexity of the viewpoints and how people want to self-identify, the just like the complexity of viewpoints in the community. Well, two things. First of all, I mean, we we all know that you know women are very much <clears throat> um, underrepresented in the game industry overall. And if you watch any of those like mainstream um, esports games, whatever, you don't see women basically playing at all. Um, so, two things I want to mention here. First of all, there is this um, idea of stereotype threat here that people still believe till today that women are not. Um, supposed to be as good as men when it comes to esports and you know game developments uh technology programming and all that jazz so um and we learned this in psychology um fairly recently that when people when women or like people of a specific background when they're being stereotyped say asians are supposed to be smart or women are supposed to be bad with math better um, doing math or things like that, people actually generally do worse when they're being reminded of their own sort of um, background. So what I want to say here is that we just, I mean, it doesn't really have to be women. Like anyone could basically um, become successful in whatever field he or she wants um, as long as we put in the effort. And I know that even though the path is really difficult entering as quote unquote a minority in, in um, industries like this one, there are still possibilities. And that brings to my second point, which is um, the idea that it is difficult, but it doesn't mean that we're not trying. Like, um, if I don't try to make a difference, then um, not that I'm saying no one else would, but like I myself have this kind of responsibility to make a difference, be it, um, you know, using games and other media to um, basically uh, promote public understanding or support um, people with different gender identities or whatever. No matter what method you use, there's always something you can do as um, an individual, like, you know, attending the meeting today. So uh, for everyone, I feel like there is this sense of obligation for us to really um, promote the things that we value and everyone should understand better to reduce the prejudice in the um, society overall. Awesome. With that, we will open up the last couple of minutes to anyone who has any burning questions that you want to ask. Could be about uh, specific identities, different experiences, or just in general, um, anything that you uh, want to know more about. Uh, may I ask a question though? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Kelsey, how did you get into this like study of Native Americans? Um, it was through a course with, um, we had to have a certain number of different kinds of like identity um, based courses for my anthropology degree. And we actually took a um, ethnicity, um and like contemporary issues class and um it had absolutely nothing to do with gender i just that's one of my passion areas and that's kind of where i followed it 
Um, but yeah, so that's where just being an anthropology major in my undergraduate. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yep. I'll ask a question. Hi, this is Emma, she, her pronouns. Um, this can be to Chelsea or anyone can answer this, but how does knowing more about gender diversity impact your own gender identity? Thanks, Emma. Um, okay. <laughs> I think that um, once you, once anyone starts to understand that things can be different, I think it kind of starts the wheels um, with thinking about how like um, you could be different. Um, I think a lot of what people are missing in their life is kind of like the probe and the permission to kind of think about things instead of um, just like knowing like, you know, I've never had to question my identity and my culture really doesn't ask me to, so why should I? Um, but I think it's really important to understand like why we do certain things and why we don't do certain things. And if that's something that we truly um, believe is best for ourselves or um, if we uh, just kind of don't need to like if you're so if you're very comfortable in your gender identity and you know these kinds of questions about like what makes me uh, identify as a man or a woman um, or something in between, um, then, you know, the worst, like the, you know, you just get reaffirmed in your identity. But I think like, especially when I first found how like different societies rank different uh, gender aspects, that like blew my mind um, because, you know, so often here like, um, even like um, men painting their fingernails um, is like, you know, sends some people into like a panic and um, to know that in different cultures, that's like a different thing um, kind of really made me realize um, not how arbitrary uh, certain things about how I thought about my gender were, but it really made me question the salience of it within myself, so. Um, so not really um, about my gender identity, but one thing that like coming in contact with Hydra has really made me super comfortable with is just like acknowledging that you can be LGBT and you can also be Indian, which was like a huge thing for me because in India, when you're closeted and you don't have like you don't find that sense of community with people, you turn to the internet and what's on the internet, a bunch of white gay people. And like, I always had this idea that you have to like westernize yourself to fit into the LGBT community, um, which is like wrong on so many levels. But um, I, in 2018, I went to my first pride in my city um, and I lied to my parents. I told them, like, I worked for a magazine at the time. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to, like, cover the event and, like, take pictures and write about it. Um, but there were so many, like, hijras there and they were dressed head to toe in saris and lehengas, which are, like, traditional Indian clothes and wearing big earrings. And there was Bollywood music playing um, and everyone was dancing and doing Indian dances. And that was such a great, like, therapeutic experience for me because I was like, oh my God, like these things can coexist, you know? Cause like, I know gay people in America love Britney Spears, but I didn't grow up listening to Britney Spears. I grew up listening to Bollywood music. And just to see like those two aspects of my identity like come together was like so cool for me. Yeah, I guess I'll just skip this one. I don't really think I have much to say other than like, again, I really come into contact with um, all the proper information and knowledge after coming to States. So um, I appreciate that. I really do. And I think we should really um, celebrate this diversity um, anywhere else. Awesome. Any last burning questions before our time is up?
Just thank you so much. This was really, really wonderful. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone, for putting this together. And um, I really appreciate it, as I was um, telling Chelsea yesterday, but now to everyone, like, again, this is a really awesome learning opportunity for me, myself. Um, and um, just the fact that we're doing this is really important. Um, from the long term for, you know, ourselves and maybe for the larger um, community. Uh, if I could add, we have a super substance event tomorrow at noon for Native American Heritage Month. But yeah, just thank you to all our speakers today and everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone.